In here we have another microphone here. We'll pass it around as much as we can. Feel free to direct any questions or any answers that you think at this point in time. number of traffic studies to look at uh, the localised impacts of the additional homes that result from the development there. And there are a number of recommendations that we can uh, do or adjustments to uh, intersections to improve the flow of traffic and also to stop rat running through the local streets. So that, that's what we've got direct control over and there's some, there's some answers there that we can implement over time as, um, as the population and the, and the development comes online. Public transport, you're absolutely right, Council has no, no control over that, but I must say the Council has uh, done a lot of work, a lot of uh, strategic work, analysis of uh, regional public transport issues, so much so that we've put um, the government to shame and we've shown them the way. Now we have a, 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 the lifting of the Green Square station, I know it's not your local station, but there was a station access fee on Green, West, Green Square station. Council's advocates had it for its removal for a long time and we've shown a 75% increase in patronage just from that initiative. The council's been advocating for light rail to service the inner city. We've got the state government now working out exactly where that light rail's going to go. So they're on, on, on board as well. So. Um, Again, to show leadership on this, Council is commissioning studies to address all those things that you've talked about. The Bunnings, uh, the ATP, um, and the, the amount of development in Redfern, Waterloo, and the impacts that's going to have on the regional road network and the local road network, because at the moment, no one else is doing it. So, uh, we are trying, we don't have absolute control, um, and we're also riding, uh, out rolling, sorry, rolling out a, an extensive bicycle network. But I must say, increasing road space, whether that's for traffic or for car spaces, is very, very, very difficult to do, if not impossible. Well, my only comment in all of that is that the one way that the council can assist us is to stand on its feet and not permit any development at all until such time as the state government sorts out the whole package. And if the council is not prepared to do that for us, they do not deserve our support now or at the poll later this year. Yeah. Allow that diversity development to be totally overdeveloped 
there's a lot of space that buildings, I am in real estate, those buildings should have been set back and those streets widened. It is an absolute nightmare on that side, and everybody knows that. We're going to have exactly the same situation on Mitchell Road. Yeah. So, so who are the um, um, financiers and suppliers to the developers? Surely they can be important. Macquarie Bank. And LaSalle. LaSalle with Clayton. And LaSalle with Clayton's, but it's Macquarie Bank with those. But who supplies concrete? Who's doing the construction work? I have no idea because the Macquarie part has not had a development application put forward yet. The only development application that's gone in so far is Leighton's, and that is open until the 8th of March for submissions from the public. Frankly, I think the government and the council's made a mega mistake in even allowing that development application to be published and put forward to the public before the, the development plan has been completed and approved. It just smacks to me of a developer trying to force an issue to get their own way. It's uh, black money. Yeah. My point is, that isn't there some benefit in taking a proactive approach by boycotting the suppliers? Yeah. You can talk about boycott, but I don't want to know about it because it's against the law. Okay. <laughs> yes? Yeah, just um, on the issue of the DCP, you know, I mentioned um, bringing that forward because of, you mentioned you've currently got developers with schemes that are outside of that and wanting to go forward with those schemes. Is that the inference of that is there are alternative developers who consider a five story or schemes that would actually fall within the current requirements? I have seen a letter from Brad Hazard, the Minister, to Clover Moore, the Lord Mayor. In that letter, he says, thank you for your note about the proposal for a nine story maximum. And I will take that on board when I make my decision. No commitment either way. I appreciate that because the developers told me that if in fact we were only going to have four or five stories, they were not going to develop the site. Now, frankly, that's not our problem. If the developers don't want to go ahead and they raced in and they paid the money and they bought the place, Macquarie, for example, is saying we've got to go to 19 storeys because we're going to have to clean up that site from the various things that are in the soil and that's how we're going to get our money back. So if they didn't do soil tests when they bought it, it's not our bloody problem. And the ridiculous part is that that's on one side of the development and on the other side of the development, Leighton's are saying, no, it's not really a problem, we'll just concrete out of the top. Ladies. So who in the hell is right and where is the council sitting in this in making a decision as to what is to happen with the clean up of the site? Well I think, I think with that, you know, there are always other alternatives commercially. If they've got an issue with um, tree and current conditions mm -hmm. so you don't necessarily have to go up and shut the additional residence. Exactly. has also developed a five storey plan. It's part of design excellence sort of thing. But they've submitted the nine storey one. But they, they are sitting on a five storey plan as well so they know about it. Well, it begs the question, they're not, they're not going to fork out and purchase a site at that much risk against the current criteria. Yeah. There must be a model that works, mm. and it's just a question of how much of the margin they want on top of it. My understanding is that they purchased the site after the last state election, and obviously they did so on the basis that they thought they were going to be eventually able to go to 19 stories and make a hell of a lot of money. Yes? Yeah, um, I would like to know, I'll first... The uh, Australia Post staff up at Newtown have told me unofficially that Australia Post is actually considering closing Newtown Post Office. That's one thing. Um, and what I would actually know, want to know about this project is what they're doing for the, um, the, the undersurface infrastructure for sewerage. So you've, you've covered um, flooding, which is great, but what are they going to do for the extra pipes? Okay. Because Chippendale, when um, the development was going on there, they hadn't allowed for that, and they had some major, major problems. I'm not aware, is there anybody, you know? No, I'm sorry, I can't answer it, but certainly we'll take it on board. Thank you. Yep. I'd like to ask about the parking. Um, I'm a resident of Motto, and at night, there's no parking now. So what's it going to be like? 
um, when they cook, just the, even the waiting ones, because uh, you can't have visitors to your apartment at all, because otherwise, unless they walk or catch public transport at night. If I and people my age don't do that. We, yeah. we don't walk around. But also night. people my age, like I've got my body problems, I've got problems with my feet, but public transport in this area is just miserable. It's already really bad. And, and that's as it is. And in terms of parking, I live on Ninth Street. Um, people just park illegally all over the footpath. 24-7 because there's nowhere else to park. And yeah. that's just how it is and that's how it is now. It's unimaginable to think of that many more people. I know, and unfortunately, as I said earlier... And if, if I could just say to the City of Sydney guy, the public transport may not be under your control, but you can control the planet. And, you know, it's, you can't just assume that people are going to... Because at the previous city that I went to, I remember people were saying, oh, you know, people will use public transport. The public transport, it has to be there and it has to be... Viable. It has to actually come, you know, more than once an hour. There has to be space for people to get on the bus. If people have mobility impairment, they already have to get on the bus, you know? Look, at, at this point in time, <laughs> at this point in time, our understanding is that there's about 1,950 parking spaces to go to the 3,200 apartments. Yeah, sure. To me, that is totally ridiculous. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's not enough. We already have a situation in Erskineville where the council has approved a block of 20 apartments with no off-street parking attached, and on the same block, on the next corner, insisted on parking being put in, and down in Turtle Lane, having uh, townhouses built with no requirement for off-street parking, and it's madness, and it's because of this stupid attitude of, in particular, the independent councillors that we're all going to ride bikes or walk and we're not going to have cars. Well, it ain't going to happen. It's Australia and it's time they got over it. It's also just ruining the character of the area. Like, this used to be, I've been in this area since 1996. This is, you know, a quiet, the community in this area is different, you know, and it's, it's becoming completely overloaded. It's completely changed. Very briefly, just to interrupt for a moment, the previous slide, which you all would have been very familiar with, I'm sure, here's our wonderful train station first thing in the morning. <laughs> Uh, I've often had to miss trains. Uh, I work up in North Sydney, so I use this. The next slide, just to give you an idea, and this is not under council's control, but it is certainly a valid reason to um, oppose any height limit over the five-storey limit. What we're looking at here is, this is studies done by the New South Wales government themselves. It was done last September, and this is a chart showing this is 100% capacity of a train. And this is the times in the morning. It's a little difficult to see, but these... Oh, where's my thing? <laughs> these times here, just to show you what we're already up against, this is the 737 train. And this is going through nearly until 9 o'clock. They are all over... And this is inbound to the city. They're all over 100%. Once you get to 135%, which is defined as everybody sitting and about four to six people in the vestibules and uh, some people standing inside, it slows the train down and throws out the timetable. They're already at an average in this area here of 140%. We're over that limit already. It's only going to get worse. I can get to work at 9.30. I'm negotiating with my boss. I guess it's going to have to be 10, 30, 10 years from now. <laughs> okay. Just a couple more questions, and then we need to get on to talk about the resolutions because it's already heading towards quarter to nine. Desmond. Oh, my question is, you mentioned there's a number of traffic studies being done for Ashmore, for Bunnings, etc., etc. We've got traffic studies being done the BEP2, we've got traffic studies being done by SMDA. When are we going to have a strategic traffic management plan for Erskineville and Alexandria? Because you can hear everybody saying what it's like now. God knows what it's going to be like in the next five years. We're in the process of uh, putting together a traffic study to look beyond Erskineville and Alexandria. And it's very similar to what we've done in the Green Square Urban Renewal Area. Um, it's called a Transport Management and Access Plan. I might have got the acronym incorrect, but it's where we look at how all the different modes of transport would work together, including cars. 
uh, what, the, what the deficiencies are in the current system, like where are the blockages, and how they might be addressed, whether that's upgrading particular intersections, whether that's making improvements to public transport, and that might be things like increasing bus lanes or the length of bus lanes or giving priorities to buses at traffic lights. Now these are the sort of things that we've been able to successfully advocate for after funding this regional study, which again is a state government responsibility, to get these changes in place in the Green Square Urban Renewal Area. Now that's what we want to do, given what's happening in, in, uh, in Build Environment Plan 2, which is the New South Wales Housing Development Area um, and things like that. E even with the BEP2, our recommendation is that they should add a, a train station at Waterloo on uh, the uh, existing airport line because it runs straight down one of the streets. So all you'd have to do is drop a station box in. Now, again, we're doing that work and we're making those recommendations to the state government. And so you're doing that for Alexandria or Erskineville as well? Absolutely. What's, so this what's the time frame? Well, those sort of studies do take a while to put yeah. together, but in the next 12 months or so. So How we should be we'll talking about increased populations, increased increased densities in this area without knowing the outcome of the traffic study. Yeah. 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 densities that have been supported uh, in the Ashmore precinct, we've done a, a number of studies uh, of local traffic implications to show that yes, there are impacts on the local streets, um, but there can be changes made to make sure that they operate within acceptable standards. Andrew, that's not to say... The rest of the suburb. That's not to say that traffic's not going to get worse. But it's within acceptable standards and limits. This lady up here has been very patient. <laughs> Two-storey buildings, 
on higher land and large scale buildings, four to six storeys, on the low lying land, and avoid recreating buildings with heights that compete with the existing landmarks, e.g. brick stacks, church spires, etc. And that is what has been overlooked in my view. Third. The Friends of Erskineville did a transport survey a year ago, I think it was, from memory, and canvassed it right through the entire area with input from all of the residents, and the council ignored it and said they didn't want it. Well, that's what we've got in here as part of the resolutions. If in fact we can't get that, then obviously we have to look at doing it for ourselves. May I just ask Can we go yeah. to promotions? Yes, in a moment. Uh -huh. so, I was going to say the greatest amenity that's being overlooked is the employment because we're losing areas of employment and saying, okay, let's fill it up with people. Then how can you do a traffic study just because you put people in there if you don't know where they're going to work? That's one of the things. Exactly. Exactly, and that's part of the resolution as well. It's small. It is yeah, the whole concept. It is crazy. You've got to question the government's requirement to put another 79% people here. Where is the need for the employment of these people? We're in a big country. So I want to ask about things that the council, I, I believe, can fund or operate um, around childcare centres and kindergartens. <coughs> so I've been waiting 15 months. I can't get my two children into a childcare centre in this area two days a week. So I have to commute back to Coogee yeah. two days a week, which I don't want to do because I like using public transport. But I have to drive to Coogee to then get the bus into the city to drive back to Coogee to drive back to Erskineville. Oh. Yeah. So is there anything in the new proposal you know, that looks at either privately funded daycare, you know, taking a place in there or what the council's going to do about um, funding new daycare centres or kindergartens. Because most kindergartens, even if you choose not to work, your child needs to go to kindergarten and most kindergartens are prioritising four-year-olds yeah. and they have one year of kindy before school because at current rates across Sydney, you can't get them in for two years because there's too many four-year-olds that need to go before they go to school. My, uh, that's one we have to take on notice, but my understanding of the plans as they exist at the moment is that there is no provision whatever. <laughs> if I could just add to that with the zoning for the, for the Holy Ghost precincts will commit that sort of private development concept. But, but does the council not take ownership of putting, like you can't just put 6,000 people there and expect that they're going to find daycare, yeah. that they're going to find kindergartens. It's probably great for the school because I know that, you know, they it's have to fight to get that over. But surely it will get over, surely it will get overcrowded. But, We can certainly take on that community service. It's essential. Oh, it's it's essential. Oh, I understand what you're saying. Okay, Councillor Burton. I just want to get back to the issue of perhaps, um, traffic and parking for a tick. Um, the reason why there'll be increased traffic, apart from an increased number of people, is that the residents in the estate that can't park their cars in there will be driving around looking for spots yeah. uh, which are then parked outside your house. Um, the problem, it is an ideological problem that the, uh, that the other councillors have, which is they don't believe in parking places. They believe that if you build on-site parking that it will encourage cars and that you can stop people having cars by not having on-site parking. So Mike's right, they are now um, approving uh, DAs of, of, of 
blocks of flats with no parking at all in, the, in this area. And uh, the ones uh, in the Ashmore Estate, there will not be enough parking for the number of people who want to have cars. So as I say, they'll be driving around and they will be certainly parking in the streets. I think in your submissions to uh, Council and to the State Government, you've got to keep saying, stop this craziness which is having a maximum number of car parking places on the development. There's got to be a minimum number of car parking places on the development. <laughs> we're opposed to car journeys and we're, and we're trying to stop people using their cars to commute. Yes, I agree with that. But we're not opposed, to, I'm not opposed to cars because people actually have to have cars from time to time to go and pick up their mum in Penrith or take the kids to soccer or something. So they've got these wretched things and they've got to put them somewhere. And the rest of the councillors stick their head in under the sand and say, if we don't make parking places, people won't have cars. So that, that's what I've got to do. Did you have to provide us as Australians to support those Just decisions? two more questions here and then There's we no need problem. to start wrapping up.
we are against development under the guise of progress that impinges upon the lifestyle of the residents of this area and doesn't provide the necessary infrastructure for us to live at a reasonable standard. Now, on the back of the agenda form was seven resolutions which covered a whole range of issues. The first resolution said, one, we don't 